Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Paul Salem, president of the Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's my honor today to welcome General Kenneth McKinsey, commander of U.S. Central Command. General McKinsey, thank you for being with us today. This is the inaugural event for MEI's Defense Leadership Series, a speakers forum for current and former high-level military and defense leaders, both from the United States and the Middle East. Uh, General McKinsey is a native of Birmingham, Alabama in the U.S. South. Uh, he's had a distinguished career both as a field commander and I might say as a military thinker and a planner. He's led Marine Expeditionary Units in Afghanistan and Iraq, but also held senior strategy and planning positions both in Central Command and in the Pentagon. He was the Marine Corps representative to the Quadrennial Defense Review a key document in the U.S. military planning process. Uh, as commander of CENTCOM, uh, the area of his concern comprises a lot of countries, it's 20 countries, for those of you in the audience who are not familiar exactly with how the military uh, sort of looks at the map. The countries include Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, the countries of the Arabian Peninsula, and Egypt. Uh, and also the five republics of Central Asia. So a lot of, lot of countries to, to uh, worry about as it, will, as it were. Uh, MacDill Air Force Base in Tampa, Florida is home to CENTCOM headquarters and that's where the general is joining us from today. The forward headquarters are in Al Udaid Air Base in Qatar. Uh, again, uh, General McKenzie, many thanks for taking the time to be with us today to share your thoughts and insights about how you see challenges and potential developments in the CENTCOM area. Our conversation with you this morning stems from our commitment to engaging with CENTCOM and the Department of Defense more broadly. Our defense and security program is our primary vehicle for this engagement. It's led by my colleague Bilal Saab, whom I want to thank for working to, this, to bring this event about. Uh, Bilal actually served in the office of the Secretary of Defense as senior advisor for security cooperation cooperation in the Middle East during 2018-2019, liaising closely with your J-5 staff. I also want to mention that your predecessor, General Joe Votel, is a distinguished senior fellow with us at MEI. We're very lucky to receive his insight and guidance. And on June 23, we're going to be hosting Brigadier General Duke Perak, who is currently the Deputy Director of Strategy, Plans, and Policy with you at Central Command. Uh, today, we have over 1,000 people signed up from around the world, and uh, that shows the level of interest in your remarks today. It also means, unfortunately, unfortunately, that we will not be able to have an audience Q&A. It's too many people to do that, but I hope that the questions that I will engage the general in will cover most of the areas that audience members might have questions about. Uh, so let's get started. General McKinsey, again, thanks again for being with us. And before we really get started into the heart of the conversation, do you have any sort of opening, uh, sort of welcome or hello remarks that you want to make to our audience? Well, thanks very much. And I appreciate the opportunity to address this forum. I think it is now, is, it's more important than ever to reach out, to be transparent, and to transmit uh, a clear understanding of what we're trying to do in the region. And uh, four like these here today are very important parts of that. So I very much appreciate the initiative of, uh, of your institute moving forward. It is a difficult and very demanding time in the CENTCOM AOR. Um, now, perhaps more so than ever, particularly when uh, coupled with the coronavirus and its impacts across the theater. And I know we'll have an opportunity to talk about that as we go forward. But I, I look forward to the dialogue we're about to enter into. And again, I thank you for I thank you for inviting me. And I'm very uh, pleased to be here today. Thank you, General. Uh, and indeed, uh, we will be talking about all that and more. Uh, let, uh, let's get started by trying to set the scene for our audience. And let me start in a way with a three-part question, a broad question, uh, three parts. Part, first part, how do you, you define uh, or how does CENTCOM define U.S. interests in the region? What are the main challenges or threats facing those interests per se? And what strategies does CENTCOM pursue to pursue the interest or to confront the threats to the interests? Thanks, Paul. Uh, and that's a very good way to, to, to break it out. It sort of mirrors the way we approach it. We look at what our interests are, 
what are the threats to those interests and how do we want to how do we want to respond to that and i'm going to talk about that but i'll begin by saying everything centcom does is nested in a whole of government approach so you know my equity is principally the security element but there are other elements that are equally and in fact far more important than than what us central command does so we work with our department of state colleagues across the theater you know we work with the interagency and also we work with states inside the AOR, as well as coalition and other alliance partners that have interest in the AOR. So when we think about answering all of these, this, this, the uh, sort of the hidden text to everything I'm going to talk about is it is much broader than just U.S. Central Command. And while we are a key part of it, we are certainly not the only part. So let me actually just start with a discussion of interests. And I think that, that there are a lot of interests we have in the AOR. I'm going to sort of highlight two interests, which may be the most important interests. The first one would be maintaining uh, in improving security and stability of the region, a key part of which is freedom of navigation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And second, eliminating the threat of terrorism from the region against our homeland, which has emanated from the region. And, and we've done a pretty good job of, of reducing over the past few years. So those are a couple of the key interests that the United States has in the region. So uh, we have actually reduced our dependence on Middle East oil over the past few years, but there is still a significant uh, requirement to secure the global supply of oil through the through the theater, even as our even as our dependence on it is is great, it is not as great as it once was. So it, it is in our interest and the, the the world's interest to ensure that freedom of navigation is available and that oil and other economic uh, uh, packages can move freely throughout the region. So we have an interest in that, and of course, two really three of the great strategic choke points of the world are in the Central Command AOR: the Strait of Hormuz the Bab El Mendeb Strait, and of course the Suez Canal, which you're, which you're well familiar with. It's the second part of it is uh, beginning really with, with, uh, with the attacks that we're all familiar with in 2001, but even before that and since then, uh, attacks have emanated from this region against the homeland of the United States. Over the past decade and over the past years, there's been a substantial decline in the number and severity of those attacks. That's the result of relentless pressure. That's the result of uh, unceasing overwatch. And that's the result of a lot of activities and efforts by the men and women of CENTCOM, the nation and our partners and allies. So if I would look at interest, that's where I would begin. So what are the threats? From where I sit today, the greatest threat to stability and security in the region is Iran. Uh, their funding of terrorism and terrorist organizations, they're propping up the murderous Assad regime, providing advanced weapons to the Houthis in Yemen, their direct attack on international oil tankers in the Strait of Hormuz, refineries in Saudi Arabia and US troops in Iraq. Iran actively stokes instability and is intent on degrading security all over the region, ultimately for their own hegemonic purposes. Uh, over time, the regime in Iran has taken a great portion of the country's wealth and prosperity and repeatedly invested it in instruments of instability and proxies. And they use violence, both state violence and proxy violence to push other nations, other regimes in the area in the direction of their agenda. Beyond Iran, there are also other terrorist organizations in the region, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, that operate in the shadows of the region, the ungoverned spaces, and we still maintain strong, vigorous efforts against those, uh, against those terrorist organizations because we know they do retain the aspiration to attack the United States and our allies, and it is only the result of direct pressure that prevents them from being able to do that. Last, we're beginning to see a resurgence, if you will, of great power competition in the Central Command AOR. Uh, as China and Russia begin to find weaknesses and begin to move into it. And Central Command, the Central Asian states and the Central Gulf region, in fact, all of, all of Central Command is becoming a newly active area of engagement uh, between us and other great powers as we, as we compete on the global stage. So what's the strategy? How do we actually carry out and try to, and try to be effective in this, in this very demanding regime? So against Iran, it's a whole of government approach. It's been led by the Department of State, as you're aware, that's known colloquially as the, as the maximum pressure campaign. A variety of sanctions and other activities have been undertaken to pressure the government of, uh, of Iran to do a variety of things, renounce nuclear ambition, cease to work on ballistic missiles, cease in exporting uh, terror and other things against their neighbors. So all of those are important things. And, uh, and so we, we support uh, indirectly the diplomatic and economic efforts that are part of the uh, that are part of the, the whole of government approach against Iran. It's important to note, there's actually no military component of what's known as the maximum pressure campaign. Instead, what our responsibility is, as US Central Command, 
is to deter Iran from taking actions either directly or indirectly against the United States or our allies and partners in the region to attempt to uh, act against the maximum pressure campaign as it continues. So that's the principal way that we contribute to that. You know, we actually do not directly contribute to the maximum ca pressure campaign, which again, as I've noted, is principally a diplomatic and a military, a, a diplomatic and an economic uh, effort uh, uh, directed by the Department of State. So that moves forward, and, and that's really one of the key strategic things that that we that we've done across the region. As we look at other things, we talked a little bit about terrorist threats emanating from the region. One of the key things we do is, first of all, apply direct CT pressure when necessary uh, against those entities. But second, we work with our partners in the region to build up their capacity to allow them eventually to be able to undertake these actions. We do this by uh, building institutional capacity building, and we don't do it alone. Uh, both in Afghanistan and in Iraq, we have a broad international coalition that is marshaled against Al Qaeda and ISIS in both uh, in both countries, and we will continue that. But we see the need to actually transfer abilities to our partners over time that would allow us to optimize our force posture in the region while st still keeping our eye on the ball. The ball being the inability of entities in the theater to develop attacks against the United States homeland. Paul, uh, I'll pause there, uh, Paul. Thank you, General. Let me sort of ask about two aspects of what you mentioned, Iran on one hand and uh, uh, Al-Qaeda and ISIS on the other. On Iran, um, last year was a year of, of great escalation, as you mentioned, with attacks on Gulf shipping, attacks on Afrique in Saudi Arabia, attacks uh, actually through proxies on the U.S. and Iraq, culminating uh, with the uh, killing of Qasem, General Qasem Soleimani in the very beginning of this year. Uh, and what we've seen, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, for most of 2020 is uh, sort of much, much less direct escalation, a kind of high tension without uh, major escalation. What, how would you currently describe sort of the, the risk situation between US forces and Iran and its proxies? Is it a, you know, a, a quiet tension? Do you think 2020 will, you know, has major risks in it? Or are you fairly, you know, what's your sense there? And do you have any contact or deconfliction with any Iranian units, whether it's uh, naval or otherwise, to avoid escalation by mistake, as it were? Sure. So um, I, I would assess that right now we're in a period of what I would call contested deterrence with Iran. Interesting. Uh, and, and that really uh, obtained from the January exchange, where we struck Qasem Soleimani, and they uh, uh, attacked our forces at, uh, at Erbil and also at Al-Assad Air Base. Uh, proceeding from that, I think the Iranians have had to recalculate because they did not believe that we would actually take that action. Mm -hmm. uh, they, did, they thought they, they had pushed for many years, I think, to find a red line, and they found a red line, and the United States responded vigorously. Uh, and so they're having to recalculate just what we're willing to do and what we're not willing to do. And I think that has had a significant effect in establishing and reestablishing a rough form of deterrence in the theater. And by deterrence, I think when I think of deterrence in the theater, I think of it in two domains principally. I think of it in what I would call state on state deterrence, where you know, attacks clearly directly attributable to Iran are not being generated. As you know, and, and as you noted in 2019, we saw state on state attacks generated from Iran against Saudi Arabia, the Aramco attack. And then we saw a state on state attack against us in early January, you know, in Iraq when they attacked the Al Assad Air Base. So I believe right now they are deterred from undertaking those activities because they have seen that we have both the capability and the will to respond. They have never actually doubted our capability because they know that we can bring significant forces to bear should the, should the situation require it. To use a term that, that, that I used in the Monoma Dialogue uh, back in November when I talked about this, it, it is possible that Iran can control the early steps of escalation in the theater. It is also clear that we will control the final steps of escalation in the theater. And so I think they've always recognized that if they get into an escalatory spiral with us. What they have always doubted though is the other component of deterrence is will. And they have doubted that we would actually have the will to act. They now see that we, we actually do have the will to act. And so I think that has caused them to recalculate. And so that's why we've seen a decline in these tensions at sea, uh, you know, in, in Iraq and in other places. Now, I don't want to paint too rosy a picture uh, because that could change very quickly. And, 
We're not dealing with a regime in Iran that always makes purely rational calculations, also beset by, by COVID and the effects of the coronavirus, which I think have had an effect on them. But nonetheless, um, you know, I think it has set them back. And one of the other areas I just briefly like to touch on is in Iraq, where uh, we, they view that as a principal battleground to operate against the United States and the coalition. It is an aspirational goal of Iran's to eject the United States from Iraq. And I think that what we're seeing right now uh, as a result of possibly what happened in January, but also other activities, I think we're going to, you know, begin in tomorrow, actually, we're going to begin a strategic dialogue with the government of Iraq at the, at the ministerial level, which is a very important uh, negotiation going forward to establish the long-term relationship we're going to have with the government of Iraq. It is my belief that the government of Iraq is going to want to retain U.S. and coalition forces. And as you know, if, if from, from my perspective, we're in Iraq to finish the defeat of ISIS and to support Iraq as they finish that defeat and come to final, uh, you know, final victory against it in terms of holding the holding ground. The caliphate no longer holds ground, but they still have the capability to carry out attacks. And so we continue to work institutionally with Iraq. Their forces are much better. We will continue going forward. We will optimize our presence in Iraq, both to be the most effective we can be as Iraqi forces gain capability and become more direct in their actions against, uh, you know, against uh, ISIS and other forces. But also, we have to take steps to protect ourselves against some Iranian presence in, in Iraq some of the Shia militant groups that would choose to attack us if given the ability to do so, and attacks from Iran itself. So we've taken measures to harden ourselves and to better posture ourselves, but that's only a small part of our total relationship with the government of Iraq, much of which will begin here in the next day during the ministerial dialogue. Uh, the, last point, the last point you asked was uh, direct contact with, with Iran, and I, there's not much I can say about that. You know, it, at a very high level, uh, those contacts may occur uh, I think we're very clear, though, uh, you know, we operate at sea and in the air. There are international guard channels that we can communicate our intent on. So they know very clearly what we're doing. And generally, they're very respectful of that. Not always. Uh, there's, you know, there are, you know, sometimes there's less than professional activities. Uh, uh, there's activities that occur out there. And uh, but by and large, I think they know and respect our capabilities. Paul, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll pause there. Thank you, General. Uh, I wanted to ask on the counterterrorism side, ISIS and Al-Qaeda, as you say, that is the concern to protect the homeland, the U.S. itself. Uh, this is a threat that's been you know, out there for 20, 30 years, and it mutates and it adapts to new conditions. No doubt that there's been a defeat of the physical caliphate, and that's a major achievement for the U.S. and for the countries of the region and the entire coalition. Uh, but obviously, this threat mutates and, and, and doesn't go away. From where you sit in CENTCOM, how do you see the map of ISIS and Al-Qaeda? Uh, where are they you know, redistributing themselves? How are they mutating? Obviously, they still exist in Syria to some degree in Iraq. You know, what's this, you know, Yemen, Afghanistan, North Africa. Uh, in this ongoing war with these particular types of terrorist groups, uh, what keeps you up at night? Sure. So let me actually start with uh, with Iraq and Syria, and I'll talk ISIS ISIS presence there. Although there is an Al Qaeda presence in Syria as well. So we have completed. Joe Votel, one of the last things he did as the, as the commander of Central Command was oversaw the completion of the physical destruction of the Caliphate up and down the Euphrates River Valley, and that was a very effective operation. But what ISIS has done is they've tried to go to ground and try to try to maintain. First, a global cyber presence, which they've been able to do intermittently, but, but they have been able to do, and also to go to a small cellular structure, which allows them to carry out local attacks. I think they always have a desire, a, uh, an aspiration to reestablish a physical caliphate. I think it's a critical part of their ideology, so I always think they will move in that direction. However, with the pressure that we've been able to put upon them, in Syria through our SDF partners and with our support up and down the Euphrates River Valley and in Iraq uh, proper, working largely with Iraqi security forces, we've been, able to, we've been able to prevent them from realizing those external attack dreams that they have and that they still, and that they still promulgate and still want to work toward. Now, this threat is not going to go away. There's never going to be a time, I believe, when either 
uh, ISIS or whatever follows ISIS is going to be completely absent from the globe from the global stage. So the future, even the brightest possible future, is not a bloodless future, but it can be a future which we would define as where local security forces are able to contain ISIS without significant external help. I'm not saying there wouldn't be some enabling support for them, but it should be able to be contained locally. And local security forces are the key. Local security forces that will be answerable to civilian leadership on the ground in these areas that would then be able to have a human rights record that would stand scrutiny and be, be understood by all, because that's another half of the equation. The cure should not be worse than the disease itself. And we're always mindful of that when we operate in Iraq and Syria. And that's an area where the Syrians, west of the Euphrates River, and the Russians are not mindful of that. So I think they will struggle, actually, to create long-term conditions that will prevent the, the systemic rise of ISIS. So we will continue to operate against them. Also, there's an Al-Qaeda element out in northwest Syria that we see in sort of that, that pocket around Idlib, that witches brew out there that's under a variety of pressure that a little bit of a ceasefire out there right now. They also maintain an aspirational desire you know, to operate outside and generate external attacks. So let me just shift now to Afghanistan for a moment. Mm -hmm. So as you know, the, the, the home of Al Qaeda is in Eastern Afghanistan, right up against the border. Very small presence there, but the, the global leader is there. He, he doesn't have the ability to talk much, or but he does actually, we think he's probably physically up in that area somewhere. We think uh, there's also a small ISIS presence there. Now, the Taliban have no friendship for ISIS, and they have actually done a great deal of work to compress ISIS over the last year. Uh, it remains to be seen if they would have the ability to actually bring ISIS to, to all the way down. Don't know. Uh, down in southern Nangarhar province. They have had success in reducing their ability to hold ground there. It is less clear to me, though, uh, the Taliban's relationship with al-Qaeda. And we can talk about that here in a little bit when we talk about Afghanistan. But the key thing I would tell you is these, and then down in the Arabian Peninsula, clearly small pockets remain there. And we try to keep CT pressure on them there. You know, ongoing events in the Arabian Peninsula sometimes make it difficult to do that. All of these entities, though, want to think globally. They want to inspire, they want to direct if they can. You know, we talk about direction of action, enabling action, and inspiring action. Today, they're limited to inspiring action. That is radicalization, typically via uh, cyber or other means of people in Western countries that are then motivated to go out and conduct lone wolf attacks or something like that. And, you know, we will work very hard to try to stop that. It is very hard for them now, though, to do enabled or directed attacks because those, me those mechanisms for the transfer of funds, for the transfer and movement of people and other things like are very hard for them to do. It is a core aspirational goal of, of ISIS certainly and Al Qaeda as well to be able to renew those, 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 that connective tissue, if you will, that links the homeland, which is my theater largely, uh, but also to Sub-Saharan Africa, US AFRICOM, uh, out into the uh, uh, Southwest Pacific and other areas. That is their aspiration. One of the key things that we try to do in this theater and also in conjunction with US Special Operations Command and the global coalition is we try to prevent the reestablishment of that connective tissue. Again, we're not gonna get to perfection on this. And, and I suspect no matter what we do and as active as we're gonna be, particularly in the cyber domain, there's always going to be the possibility of radicalization from a distance and people that are just going to be inspired by the, you know, by the virulent message uh, that these entities put forth. So that's always going to be a threat. But what we want to do is prevent organized, uh, organized detail planning, because, you know, when you're running for your life up and down the Euphrates River Valley, listening to the noise of an MQ-9 overhead, uh, it's hard to think about conducting attack planning against Detroit. So, you know, if you, if you don't know where your next meal is coming from, it's hard to hold an organized meeting of the board of directors to talk about global planning. So that's sort of how we get after these things, and we will continue to do that, Paul. Thank you, General. Uh, uh, you mentioned the great power competition in your sort of uh, initial uh, response to the general question, and certainly the national defense strategy identifies great power competition with China, but also with Russia as uh, sort of very high concerns of, of uh, defense planning. Uh, I wish you'd unpack for us a little bit how that translate in the, translates in the Middle East. I mean, as you were just describing, what you're focused on mainly in the Middle East is ISIS and Al-Qaeda containing or deterring Iran and maintaining the free flow of oil or energy. 
uh, you didn't necessarily mention that what keeps you up at night is what is the Chinese doing or what are the Russians doing. So how does that great power competition translate in the Middle East? I understand how it translates in the Pacific or it translates maybe in Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, when the Russians entered Syria, and not to get into the politics, but the Obama ad administration didn't seem terribly alarmed. Uh, this administration, President Trump, doesn't seem particularly, you know, alarmed about the Syrian, about the Russian presence in Syria, for example. And China, so far in the Middle East, has been largely focused on economics and oil and trade. And although they have, you know, they do have a base in the, in the Red Sea. So, when you talk about China and Russia at the CENTCOM level and geostrategic concerns, uh, what does it mean to you? What is that great power competition? mean to you? Sure. So I was actually uh, on the joint staff as the director of strategy plans and policy, and then the director of the joint staff when, when the, the NDS uh, came to be. So I was president at the creation of that document. And the fact of the matter is, for, for almost 20 years, our focus has been on central command globally, uh, particularly at the military level. We've looked to fight campaigns in Afghanistan. We've looked to fight campaigns in Iraq. Uh, and other and, and, and across the theater. And so we have optimized, we optimized the force for that at the cost of certain other things. Meanwhile, we were being studied by China and Russia and most dangerously China, I would argue. And so they have, uh, they've gained a march on us in, uh, in studying our strengths and weaknesses and preparing for a long-term competition for us. We have adapted to that. And the department realizing that we need, to, we need to turn to where the greatest threats are and the threat of near peer competitors lies in China and Russia. It does not align, it does not lie in the CENTCOM AOR. So you have to shift a couple of things. You gotta shift resources. And, I've, and we have shifted resources from the US Central Command AOR uh, to go principally to indo pacom but also to UCOM, where we can more directly confront those threats at a military level. And that is global force management on a daily basis. You know, that's what you use to fight tonight or next week. And, and, but more important, actually, are the longer term commitments we've made to force design and other things that allow us to that will allow us to compete and prevail, if necessary, militarily against those great power competitors, you know, in Indo-PACOM and in US, U.S. European Command. So I, I'm completely on board with all of that. You know, the trick, though, is it's not a binary thing or a uh, you have a, a global power, and we are the definition of a global power, indeed a global superpower, you have to think in terms of, the, of a globe. You don't have the luxury of focusing on any one theater. We have seen the bad effects of focusing on a single theater when we focused at CENTCOM for too long. As we go forward, we need to take a nuanced view of this, but clearly we need to focus on China and we need to focus on Russia. And I believe resourcing in the department is properly moving in that direction and I think we're going to begin to, we are beginning to do the things we need to do in order to, 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 to provide for the whole of government, the military element of national power and what it needs to do. Now, bringing it back a little bit to CENTCOM, competition uh, among, among global powers does not occur in, you know, neatly designated AORs. In fact, I would argue that one of the wild west, if you will, areas of global competition is actually the CENTCOM AOR, where we see China moving in, as you noted, Paul, principally economically, but not completely, but principally economically to establish a beachhead uh, that, that other things will follow over time. Because the fact of the matter is China gets over 50% of their oil through the Strait of Hormuz. Additionally, there are vast mineral and other deposits in the, in the theater that China would certainly like to have access to. Uh, and they would prefer to do it under somebody else's security auspices, but who knows what they'll think, what their design will be in the long term. But I think this is a significant factor that we need to confront. So as I think of China, and actually I do worry about China quite a bit because it is one of my core taskings. So you know, we think about how we assure our partners in the region uh, that we're going to be around, that we're going to be dependable partners, that the FMF, uh, the FMS sales, the military sales that we make to them are the best possible choice for them. Uh, we don't want them turning to China. We don't want them turning to Russia to buy those systems because if they buy with us, they'll get a good system. And, they'll, and then we will also have a measure of control over the, how those systems are used. As you know, the Chinese and the Russian, there's, that, there's, no, there's no end user control at all on those. And, and so I think that is, nations accept that given the quality of our systems, and also given the assurance of the United States that stands behind those systems. So that's one of the principal things I do in the region to counter 
you know, the growing encroachment of China uh, into the region. Now, let me just talk a little bit about Russia. And so, y yes, we do see Russia. Russia doesn't have the economic resources to come into the region in the way that China is. We do see them, you know, where they are, though, it's pretty high intensity. We see them in Syria, as you noted. And, uh, and, and they're just a fact of life in Syria. Perhaps had we made decisions in the past, we might be in a better place with them right now. I am not one of those people who thinks the Russians are master chess players and see four or five or six moves ahead, and, and therefore they know what to do. I think going into Syria was opportunism. I think staying in Syria is opportunism. And it brings together a, a certain number of very predictable threads in Russian foreign policy. I mean, they want a warm water port. They want to maintain a relationship with one of their painfully few foreign client states. Uh, and so that, that means Assad, and it gives them an opportunity to do that. It also gives them an opportunity to throw sand in our gears and to make it harder for us. And it gives them at a fairly low cost of entry the opportunity to at least appear to be a player on the global stage when it, com when it comes to Middle Eastern issues. So I think all of those things sort of drive Russia. So we see more Russian military hardware in the theater, albeit in a very circumscribed part of the theater, you know, principally in, principally in Syria. We don't see them much at sea you know, in either in the, in the Arabian Gulf or the Gulf of Oman or in the Red Sea. So we don't see much of that. I know they're in the Eastern Mediterranean. And, and I talk friend, uh, frequently to my friend Todd Walters and U.S. European Command about that. But this is a new fact of life. And we have to we have to come to grips with it. And again, the best way we come to grips with it is through continued outreach with our partner partners, continued demonstration of U.S. resolve in the theater. So our partners know that we're a steady security partner going forward. I'll pause there. Thank you. Uh, thanks, General. Let me uh, pivot to what's on everybody's mind, uh, COVID-19. Uh, you are a massive global organization. You are, you know, in, in the managing part of it with thousands of, of officers and troops uh, and a lot of, you know, challenges of movement and operations and so on. Uh, so my question is sort of two part on COVID. First of all, how has it affected you, uh, CENTCOM, the operations of the military? Does it make it harder to work, harder to operate? Uh, what are, you know, how has it affected you? And secondly, how it has affected the, you know, both your partners in the region and your adversaries in the region? Uh, sure. Is there less threat because of COVID, more threat? Uh, does it slow down ISIS? Does it slow down your Gulf partners? Let me begin by just describing how, how we deal with it. And we, we've, you know, I spend a lot of time, we, we meet frequently with the Secretary of Defense to talk about the department's response to, uh, to, to COVID-19. So this is one that he has very clearly taken direct leadership on. He and the chairman have been very clear and we have great uh, discussions back and forth several times a week on how the department is responding to the threat of COVID. So a couple of things, the principal thing I wanna do when I talk about COVID is I wanna ensure the, the, the safety and health of our personnel and our families that are you know, in the US Central Command region. So that's a very high priority for me. The second thing I need to be able to do is I need to be able to continue operations. And, and so we, we do that. And the third thing that I wanna be able to do is I wanna be able to assure our partners in the region. So how do I assure our partners in the region? I make sure that we have elaborate uh, mechanisms in place. As you know, US Central Command has no forces that are permanently assigned. So people that come in and out of CENTCOM rotate in, in and out, either as individuals or in unit movements, either on ships or in large you know, aircraft that bring in people hundreds at a time. So what we do is we make sure when they come into the theater, these people are clean. They've done a restriction, restriction of movement period. They've been tested. So when our US service members come into the theater, they're clean. And so I can tell with confidence our partners in the region that look, we're not bringing, we're not bringing COVID in. We're bringing clean people into the theater. At the same time, we negotiate with, uh, with our partners. Some of them have 14 day restriction period themselves. You know, if, if we can generate, if we can demonstrate that we do it in the United States, often that meets the requirement. But what we wanna do is make sure that we are sensitive to their requirements here in the theater. So we work that on a daily basis, forces coming in. Additionally, what we've done is I've been well stocked with what I need to protect the force. And by the force, I mean not only U.S. forces, but our, but our coalition partners that are here in the theater as well, with everything from surgical masks to hospital gowns to ventilators to the capability to do uh, 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 high-end medicine as well as you know, moderately ill medicine. Additionally, we have procedures in place to aromatically, aromatically 
evacuate people if we need to take them out of the theater. So we've got a really uh, extremely well-developed approach to how we handle the, 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 uh, the coronavirus in the theater. I'm briefed every day on, uh, on new cases. I'm briefed every day on the status of, of, of personnel, how we move people back and forth. So we look at that uh, all the time. So the, the net result of it is, it has not had a significant impact on our ability to conduct operations. Let me give you one example. We have an aircraft carrier in the theater. Uh, the U.S. Navy goes to exquisite lengths to ensure that that carrier is COVID free. Uh, there's some remarkably uh, good ideas and some remarkable thinking that's gone on from our Navy component and from the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Mike Gilday and the entire Department of the Navy to make sure that our ships at sea are not affected by this. Because there are a couple of things that, as you would recognize, are particularly important. We can't have ships at sea affected. We can't have flight crews affected. So we go to great lengths to make sure that those personnel are particularly well protected. But we have great protection for everyone else as well. And we look at it every day. So we have the capability to continue all our missions with very minimal degradation. It does affect some of the operational things we do, particularly in Afghanistan and in Iraq. We're now very mindful of how we do outreach with our partners. Because while both those countries are trying to do the best they can, they do not have the resources or the capability to, to get after the coronavirus in the way that we do. Nonetheless, we still have an obligation to talk and meet with our people. We try to do it in a, uh, in a variety of ways uh, as we get to it. Social distancing, uh, sometimes we do it by teleconference, as you and I are doing today. And sometimes, you know, you just have to go out and see them. You got to accept a little bit of risk and you do the best you can with, with face masks and other things to protect yourself. But we are very mindful of that. So I'm comfortable in our ability to carry out our mission. So now let me just talk to, uh, let me, and, and, and the other thing that we do that is very important is, is, you know, China, Russia, and Iran have a very large disinformation campaign active against the United States, you know, as the source and exporter of COVID. It's just it's simply nonsense. And the great lengths to which we go in the theater to protect ourselves and protect our partners in the theater is ample evidence of this. And so we also invest a lot of time making sure the correct narrative is out there because that other narrative is simply flawed. So what does it mean then to our friends in the region? Uh, they're grappling with it. You know, I think uh, penetration of the uh, coronavirus in Afghanistan is significant. Uh, they have a very nascent public health organization. We work with them to try to help them on that. But I remain concerned about penetration in Afghanistan. I also remain concerned about penetration in Iraq because those are areas, first of all, uh, where the, the populations are vulnerable but also I have a significant number of distributed U.S. personnel. You know, in Saudi Arabia or in uh, UAE or in Qatar, as an example, I can isolate U.S. personnel. They're a little more uh, distributed in those two countries, so they are a little more vulnerable to this kind of thing. So we work very hard to try to, you know, to try to help our partners in those areas, but it remains a concern. Some of the other GCC countries have actually, they're taking very aggressive steps at monitoring, at, uh, at, uh, at medical treatment. So we're working closely with them. I think it does have an effect. Uh, it does have an effect on them. And I, I, it is difficult sometimes to know exactly where the peak of those, uh, the peak of the virus penetration has occurred yet. We, we're right in the middle of it right now, I assess in the region, could be, could be still ahead of us yet in a couple of countries. They're actually working that. Let me take the third part of your question, which is what does it mean to adversaries and potential adversaries? I think the Taliban is significantly penetrated by it. I think it's no different than the, the population of Afghanistan. That's an unfortunate thing because I think anything, anything that tends to destabilize decision making at a critical period of time is inherently not good. And so I think that, that's, a, that's a bad thing. Uh, but I do think it is affecting them. I think they still try to carry out operations. And I think at the tactical level, they're still very active as a result of that. You know, in, in, in Iraq, we see... Uh, we see KH also affected by it as well. And I believe it may have slowed the tempo of their operations. Although they're also, I believe, deterred and under direction not to attack us right now. So I think, and we'll see how long that's able to actually be carried out. Let me sort of turn to the country in the middle of the AOR that may be the worst affected of all. And that of course is Iran. So we believe by a variety of very poor decisions uh, about how to actually address the coronavirus and decisions about just to power through and ignore it. I think there are significant uh, there's significant penetration in Iran. And I think that penetration is extended even to the senior leadership. And I think it's also uh, something that you see in the IRGC and in other entities. And I think they have not been completely straightforward with their people. And, uh, and as a result of that, 
the distrust that, that you begin to see in Iran against leadership is perhaps magnified. You know, that plays also into some of that comes from the shoot down of the jet over Tehran on, uh, you know, back in January. All of that feeds into a narrative that the government is not particularly effective. Also, because the border of Iran and Iraq is, to, to say it's porous would be a minimalist description of it. People go back and forth. So there, it's a net ex exporter of, uh, of, the, of the virus in the theater. The same thing in Afghanistan in the East. So I think that uh, I had an opportunity back in March to, to, to give my opinion uh, to Congress actually about whether I thought this would tend, what the effect this would be. I'm not certain, the last point was, we do believe Iran has made great sacrifices to ensure that what they would consider to be their core capabilities remain intact. And I would define those as their ballistic missile force, their strategic air defense force, some of their Navy uh, elements, as well as the IRGC. We believe they've gone to great lengths to try to protect those forces to moderate degrees of success. But I assess today, they are still very capable in those areas. But I think as a, as a government writ large, they are struggling. I am not certain that it makes them less dangerous. And that's about the best you know, it's a very opaque problem. We look at it very hard. And that's about the best I can do, Paul. Over. Thank you, General. Uh, you've talked a fair amount about, you know, uh, Iraq and you know, the beginning of a strategic dialogue there. We've talked about Iran and uh, sort of the tentative deterrence, uh, tense deterrence that you described. Let me ask you about two big theaters, maybe one bigger than the other, uh, Afghanistan and, and Syria. Uh, and ask you about how you see the path ahead for CENTCOM or U.S. forces in, 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 in both areas. Obviously, in Afghanistan, there's been negotiations with the Taliban. There is a political process there, and yet there is no uh, uh, victory over the Taliban. Uh, do you see the path ahead in Afghanistan as one where the U.S. will simply remain there fairly indefinitely in a sort of a supportive role and so on while the Taliban continues to exist? Or do you see a potential for an actual US withdrawal? And in Syria, the presence is obviously much more limited in terms of uh, space and personnel. President Trump several times has said he's wanted to leave, but so far that's not the case. What do you see the scenario uh, you know, in the, in the months or a couple of years ahead in, in Syria? Sure, Let's, uh, let me begin with Syria. So. Uh... Today, we work with our SDF partners in what we call the Eastern Syria security area. Generally, it's an area east of the uh, Euphrates River uh, that includes uh, Dera, uh, east of, east of Dera Azar. Uh, and then we also have a pocket down at Antaf. Uh, our primary purpose for being in Syria is to conduct operations against ISIS. And we do that through our partner, the SDF, that is there. Uh, additionally, uh, we're there to uh, assist the SDF in the maintenance of the oil facilities for their use to help them generate income, which then could be used for a variety of things, some of which would be to continue operations against, against ISIS in the area. So, you know, the decision on the long-term way forward, uh, Paul, is going to be ultimately a political decision. Um, we still have work to do there. But we are firmly focused on ISIS as the principal reason at the Department of Defense level, the military level, for why we're there. The U.S. government has larger uh, larger things in Syria, but from the, the guidance I've given my force, uh, that's where we are. Now, what we're seeing is over time, uh, you know, uh, Bashar Assad is gonna probably turn to the East and he's probably gonna increase pressure on us. And we'll deal with that as it happens. Um, but it, the one thing that I would also note, and I alluded to it a little bit earlier in our conversation, west of the Euphrates River, in areas where uh, the Syrians have cleared and where, you know, the, with their Russian partners and their support and where the Iranians operate a little bit, none of the, none of the things that have uh, that brought ISIS to, to life originally uh, have been fixed. None of the basic human, human things that need to happen to answer basic human requirements are being fixed. And any plan that does not give you a route to that is a plan for failure west of the Euphrates River. East of the Euphrates River, you know, our RSDF partners, we're trying to put local stability forces in that will try to build to that, build to that end in the long term. I do not know how long we're going to remain in Syria. Clearly, we're not going to stay in there forever. At some point, we're going to come out. And that's a political decision, and we'll be ready to execute those orders when that, when that time comes. But so long as we are there, we're going to continue to operate against ISIS. We're going to continue to help our partners hold on to their 
uh, infrastructure in the area. And we're going to continue to support the SDF as they build the local forces that will be necessary to provide the kind of local security, ultimately, you know, that's there. Additionally, you know, Paul, one other thing is SDF sits on prisons in, uh, you know, in the Eastern Syria security area where there's over 10,000 ISIS detainees, including 2,000 that we would characterize as hardcore foreign fighters. That's an issue that we need to, that's an issue that we need to think about as we go forward. Uh, you know, we, we do not provide direct security for that. The security is actually indirect. Additionally, there, you know, there's a significant humanitarian issue in Syria as well. You know, there, there are million, over, well over a million refugees in Syria, but the, sort of the poster child for it is the Al Hall refugee camp, where there are about, depending on the day, 65, 70,000 people, generally uh, women and young children, uh, and that is an area that is of great concern to me going forward for two reasons. First of all, while I think there's a minimal quality of life there, and it is a minimal quality of life there, uh, it, we are unable to actually affect what radicalization may be occurring there. So I worry about COVID penetration into that environment where it would spread virulently. It would be an incubator for it. And I also worry that unless we come up with a long-term solution to de-radicalization, and really that long-term solution needs to be something embedded in the region. It's not going to be able to be exported from the United States or from Europe, despite our, our desire and our best efforts to do so. We're actually building the next generation uh, that's going to affect us 10 or 15 years from now. And that worries me a lot as I look at Syria, because we don't have good answers to those problems yet. I know that our Department of State, which actually works these problems, is aggressively working it. For example, with the foreign fighters, what we'd like to do is repatriate, uh, but nations have to agree to take them. And not all nations will agree to take them. So, you know, the, the efforts of our diplomats is very important. And I know they're continuing that. And we full, fully support them going forward. Additionally, we support the other elements of our government, USAID, among others, that are helping to provide resources to the refugee camps that are there. And Al Hall is just the largest number. So Syria is a, is a, is a very difficult problem. Uh, and, and we will continue, we will continue to uh, we'll continue to, our operations against ISIS. Ultimately, the decision will be a political decision, which we'll be immediately responsive to. Let me just turn to the east a little bit and, and talk about Afghanistan, sort of the, the second half of your, your, of your question. So the long-term goal for us in Afghanistan is the prevention of attacks against the, against the homeland and against the homelands of our partner, our, our coalition partners that have emanated, that we know have emanated from that area before. So as I look at it from a military uh, commander, that's the, that's the equity that I have in it. And that's the degree of which I'm interested in how things go forward. We are at a very critical time now. Uh, we are on the cusp, perhaps, of inter-Afghan negotiations. And that's not a military issue, so I won't comment on it, except to say that we may be coming up on that. And I think that will be very important to get that dialogue started, because that dialogue might offer the opportunity to get to a ceasefire. We are not in a ceasefire now. The Taliban have been scrupulous about not attacking the United States or our coalition partners. They have, however, continued to aggressively operate against uh, the Afghan military forces and Afghan security forces, typically not in the cities. While there have been attacks in the cities, those have generally been ISIS, but there have been other attacks, significant attacks, uh, over the, really ever since the agreement's been signed. It went down a little bit over the Eid, which we were thankful for, but now it's beginning to ramp back up. So, that the, so the government of Afghanistan is beginning, I think, to coalesce, coalesce around a potential bargaining position that will allow them to go into negotiations. I think the Taliban needs to demonstrate that they're gonna be faithful partners too. And, you know, again, I said in testimony earlier this year, you know, we don't have to like the Taliban. We don't have to believe the Taliban. What we need to do is watch the Taliban and see what they do. Uh, and that's all we need to see. And it is, un in, it is uh, unclear to me yet that they are fully embraced this and are ready to move forward. We'll know more in the, in the, in the days ahead. And again, this, this opportunity for dialogue is gonna be absolutely vital. We, have, we are in the process of executing our obligation under this agreement. We're coming down to mid 8,000. We're gonna be ahead of the timeline that we signed up to do to do that. So we'll be at those numbers. And then eventually, as you know, we also agreed that we'd go to in May of uh, 2021. If conditions will allow, we're prepared to go to zero. However, the important phrase is if conditions will allow. Those conditions would be, you know, can we be assured that attacks against us will not be generated there? And as of right now, I don't think those can, frankly, if asked my opinion, those conditions have not been fully met. So we'll continue to work that. Uh, and we're engaged in a very robust dialogue across the interagency and with our NATO and coalition partners as we evaluate the way forward. But 
And, you know, one, one last thing I would say, and I think everybody listening to this conference certainly realizes it, the threat to the United States is not the Taliban. It's never been the Taliban. It's the entities that they allow to live in Afghanistan that threaten us. And really, we're talking about ISIS and we're talking about al-Qaeda. And as I've noted earlier, we believe the Taliban actually are no friends of ISIS and will work against them. It is less clear to me that they will take the same action against al-Qaeda. And only time will tell. And we will know that by observation, not by things that they say, but rather things that they do, that they do. And those are the things I believe that should actually inform our actions going forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, let me ask you about, uh, I mean, another part of the region which has gone through a horrific uh, civil war and a lot of uh, a lot of pain and suffering, which is Yemen. Uh, there is not a large U.S. presence there, unlike uh, Afghanistan or Iraq uh, or Syria. But I wanted to ask you a couple of things. What are, you know, what are the main concerns uh, when you look at uh, Yemen? Certainly there's a counterterrorism aspect to it. There's maybe, as you mentioned earlier, a security of the Red Sea and Bab el uh, And there's also a, a regional presence, a proxy conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia and so on. So when you, when you look at Yemen as CENTCOM, and I know, you know, White House, State Department, you know, are engaged politically and uh, with the UN to try to resolve some of these issues, but what does Yemen mean to you? What is the level of engagement, whether it's counterterrorism or naval security? Sure, so let me just start at the, at the broadest possible level. It's, it's, my, it's my judgment based on a dialogue, mill-to-mill -mill dialogue with in, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and meetings I've had there, that you know Saudi Arabia genuinely seeks a negotiated end to the conflict in Yemen. I believe they are now at a point where that is what they desire, and they would like to, they, they, they're willing to negotiate, and I believe are negotiating in good faith to try to come to that end. Uh, the Houthis uh, have an opportunity here, actually, I think, to come to an agreement that would give them a lot of the things that they want. Uh, unfortunately, there's a third party to these negotiations, and that third party is Iran. And Iran has no interest in this war being over. In fact, there's nothing better for them than for Saudi to continue to bleed out, for the Houthis to continue to launch attacks into Saudi Arabia, and for this to continue to continue to go on is something they can use to further embarrass the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia on the international stage. So I think if we could if we could reduce the Iranian uh, patronage, if you will, for the Houthis, we might be able to get to an ultimate solution there, and that would allow other things to happen. Look, our interest in this is primarily, as, as, as we've spoken before, is primarily CT, counterterrorism. You know, the last actual attack against the United States was generated by AQAP coming out of the Arabian Peninsula. They are down now. But if, if, if we're unable to continue to focus on them and pressure is not kept constant, it is possible that they will come back. It's in all our interests. It's in the in, in interest of all the parties in Yemen, and I believe all the parties in Saudi Arabia as well, to come to a negotiated settlement in Yemen. And I think UAE also would, 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 uh, would sign up for that. The only party that's not interested in that happening actually is Iran. It's a bleeding ulcer that they can, they can, continue, to, uh, they continue, they can continue to encourage at a relatively small investment that embarrasses their opponents in the region and allows them to continue to, to dig against Saudi Arabia. So, you know, Martin Griffiths and the, and the UN, his work there has been very, it's been very helpful. It continues. But I think there's still pressure on the Houthis, some of which we see, some of which is not completely uh, open and evident to us, that prevents them from actually grasping the opportunities that they have right now. Because I think they have some good opportunities, because I believe the Saudis are genuinely interested in trying to come to closure on this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let me ask you about uh, Lebanon in general. I know that uh, CENTCOM has a good relationship with the Lebanese Armed Forces, uh, and that uh, cooperation continues. Uh, uh, also, Lebanon obviously is a very complicated country. Hezbollah, an ally of Iran, has a lot of power and presence there. Uh, how do you describe sort of your, your CENTCOM's relationship in, in Lebanon? How do you look at the country? How do you look at your cooperation with the Lebanese army? Sure. So, um, first of all, you know, Lebanon is a uh, bewilderingly complex country with an extremely complex constitutional system that's designed to provide a, you know, a multi-sectarian government and provide confessional opportunities for different elements within the government. So uh, right now they're under significant economic pressure and I think that's had an effect on, on governance and stability in the region as well. Um, and clearly, uh, you know, Lebanese Hezbollah, they wanna, they wanna have a role in the government, they wanna, and yet they don't want all the responsibility for it. And we worry about their relationship to Iran, although I do not think that uh, 
Lebanese Hezbollah necessarily answers immediately when Iran calls. I do think they have a strong and powerful relationship. Look, the counterbalance for us is the, is the LAF, the Lebanese Armed Forces. Not a perfect relationship and not a perfect organization by any means, but one that we should view aspirationally is ultimately the expression of state security you know, in Lebanon. It should be the LAF. It shouldn't be anybody else. And I know that people occasionally get frustrated with the LAF and we talk about cutting on and off funding. I support continued funding to the LAF because look, in U.S. Central Command, we live in the land of less than perfect choices. And I believe that they offer the best opportunity to provide security and sovereignty for Lebanon. And while that will never be perfect, nonetheless, it's the best that we can do under very difficult circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, General. Our time is almost up. I want to ask you a sort of over the horizon question. Uh, a former Secretary of Defense said there's known knowns and known unknowns and unknown unknowns. Uh, COVID was, I would say, a known unknown. You know, uh, everybody has noted pandemics happen. We don't know where or when. Uh, my question is, when you look uh, today or over the horizon, what are, you know, different types of threats other than the conventional, you know, a terrorist group uh, using certain means, whether that is cybersecurity issues, cybersecurity concerns that are real uh, to you and that you have to fight and combat on a daily uh, presence, uh, daily case, obviously space security and satellite security has become a big issue with Chinese capacity there and the U.S. establishing a space force. Beyond sort of the traditional or conventional way of looking at, at your security or the issues that you, you, you're, you keep you up at night, what is over the horizon that might sort of hit you in the face like COVID did? What, what are the black swans or white swans that you worry about? Sure, this is more of a, a white swan because I think we see the contours of it now, but I'll, I'll begin by it. It is the proliferation of small unmanned aerial platforms in the theater. You know, I, I argue all the time with my Air Force friends that the future of flight is vertical and it's unmanned. And, uh, and I believe we are seeing it now. Uh, and I'm not talking about the large unmanned platforms, which are the size of a conventional fighter jet that we can see and deal with as, as we would any other platform. I'm talking about one that you can go out and buy at Costco right now in the United States for $1,000, a, you know, a four quad, a four quad uh, rotorcraft or something like that, that can be launched and flown. And with very easily, with very simple modifications, it can be made into something that can drop a weapon, a, a hand grenade or something else. Right now, the fact of the matter is we're on the wrong side of that equation. We're working very hard to fix it. It concerns me. Uh, we have a variety of systems in the CENTCOM AOR. I know that it has the direct attention of the Secretary of Defense and, and Ellen Lord and other people within the department. And we just made the Army the executive agent for counter UAS. And all of those are good things. And I know the Army will, will focus on it directly. But it worries me because I think what we're seeing is the emergence of really, it's not a new form of warfare, but it's a new, it's a new component of warfare. And eventually, I think you're going to see manned aircraft that are going to be supported by unmanned aircraft flying as parts of that system. It's going to be a system of systems. But on the ground right now, I worry about our ability to protect against swarms of those craft. And, you know, a lot of people are working that. And uh, right now, it's the cost imposition curve is against us. It's harder to defend against than it is to create those things. So I think at, a, at an operational level, that's a that's a that's a that's a worrisome thing. The second thing is, you know, you sort of talked on it, uh, Paul. For all of my career, um, well, actually, uh, after the, the first ten years of my career, we trained to fight the Russians, and uh, and I was trained to not expect to be able to communicate in that tactical environment. Uh, as an infantryman, uh, we just did not expect to be able to use our radios. Then, uh, over the twenty or thirty years that followed, we became addicted to communications, and particularly to the wide band dissemination of information that exploitation of satellites bring. That era is drawing to an end and space is no longer an uncontested domain. And we're back sort of to where I began my career where you can, you're no longer gonna be able to count on all that gigabyte of data that's gonna flow down to you. And in fact, if you transmit and emanate, you're probably gonna be targeted and hit either kinetically or perhaps just as lethally in terms of operations, non-kinetically non by some form of cyber operation. So that worries me quite a bit. Things that we have depended on for a long time that are now going away. Those two things worry me uh, as much as coronavirus or even more uh, going forward, Paul. Uh, well, General McKenzie, this has really been a very fascinating and rich discussion. Really thank you again for taking the time. 
many more issues I would have liked to ask, to ask about, and I'm sure the audience would have liked to hear about, but uh, uh, that concludes our session uh, for the day. Uh, let me mention in closing that the next episode in this series will be with, uh, uh, will feature Michelle Flournoy, the former Under Secretary, Secretary of Defense for Policy. That will be on uh, June 16, and you can find details of that at mei.edu forward slash events. And as I mentioned earlier in this broadcast, on June 23, we'll be hosting Brigadier General Duke Pirac, Deputy Director of Strategy Plans and Policy at U.S. Central Command. Uh, General McKenzie, thanks for taking the time uh, and uh, sharing all these uh, analyses and insights and thoughts. Hope to see you in person when travel becomes easier and uh, all the best to you and to the, all of the audience that has been following us uh, online. Thank you. Paul, oh, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and you're lucky to get Michelle Flournoy. I am a product of Michelle Flournoy. I spent a year and a half working as a fellow for her. She's one of the most remarkable leaders in government or out of government that I've ever had the pleasure to work for. And I know she'll be a great, she'll be a great person to have. Thanks so much. I've enjoyed our time today and I look forward to seeing you in the flesh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.